In this video, I'm going to show you how I took this YFZ450 with no motor and made it super fast with an electric powertrain. Once I remove everything related to the gas engine, this should be a perfect frame to build on as I can fit a really big motor and battery in it. To give you an idea of how big the motor I'm going to be using is, here's an MY1020 motor. This motor is pretty standard for upgrading Razor dirt bikes. Now here's the motor that I'm going to be using. This thing is absolutely massive. It's a QS180 motor rated for 8000 watts continuous, although as you'll see in a bit, it can do a lot more. When I compare the phase wires, it looks like an optical illusion, like I'm holding the QS motor's wires way closer, but I'm not. They're just that much bigger. Already, I ran into my first problem. The sprocket I bought does not fit the motor shaft. So, I'm just going to grind a little bit on the motor shaft to make it fit. I ended up grinding it a little more to get the sprocket closer to the motor. After I put the sprocket on the motor, I put the motor in the frame and I realized the chain is not nearly long enough, so I'm going to need a new chain. My next issue was that the threads for the motor mounts were not a common size, so I had to order some special bolts from the bolt depot. When I received them, I realized they sent me 8 10mm bolts by mistake, so I emailed them and they said, oh that's our bad, I'll send you some more. And then they sent me 5 12mm and 3 10mm, so I definitely would not recommend this company. Here's how the motor looks mocked up in the frame. I think it's going to be a perfect fit. Now it's just time to grab some scrap metal and start welding up some motor mounts. Lucky for me, these quads all have the chain adjustment on the rear axle, so I don't have to worry about that. Now it's time to look at the controller. This controller is a FarDriver ND72000B, which means it's for 72 volt batteries, it can do 500 battery amps, 1000 motor amps, and it's for encoder motors, not Hall Effect sensor motors. It doesn't have a very good heat sink, so it may overheat, but we'll see. If I put the plastic back on the quad frame, you can see the battery used to be mounted all the way back here, so I think I'm going to mount the controller back here to try and keep the weight distribution the same. That's a super convenient fit, and I think it should be pretty easy to mount. One thing I need to do is cut all this plastic off the bottom so the controller can get some good airflow. Here's how I'm going to mount the controller, it's pretty self-explanatory. Another reason I wanted to mount the controller here is because the motor wires are the perfect length. The three phase AC electricity that these wires carry is super efficient so it doesn't really matter if they're pretty long. However, the DC electricity that the battery outputs is not efficient over long distances so I'm going to use some copper to give it the absolute lowest resistance. This will also allow me to bolt multiple cables to the controller. For each terminal, I cut three copper sheets out and then added two little extra pieces on the thin part. Here's how it looks all finished up. Right now I'm just using one set of cables, but as you can see I can bolt three sets of cables to it in the future. I also switched those rivets out for some bolts because the rivets got loose right away. Here's how the motor mounts turned out. This right side was really easy, I just put some brackets like this. This left side was a bit harder since it was not aligned with the frame, but I think I did a pretty good job and it's worked great so far. After that, I borrowed a battery and strapped it to the frame and it was time for the first test ride. I know this gear ratio is probably way too high, but I wanted to try it anyways. My suspicion about the gear ratio was correct. As you can see here, I'm going full throttle and I'm going over 50 miles an hour and the motor isn't even spinning at 3000 RPM. When I go to this motor's page on qsmotor.com, we can see it's rated to spin up to 7000 RPM, so I really need twice as much gearing on this four-wheeler. To have more torque and less speed, I need either a larger sprocket on the axle or a smaller sprocket on the motor. As you can see, the sprocket on the motor is already as small as possible, so that means I need a larger axle sprocket. 
I decided to order a custom made 58 tooth aluminum sprocket. You would think this would be pretty expensive, but it was only 125 bucks from Rebel Gears. I would definitely recommend them, I just told them what quad I had and the number of teeth I wanted and they whipped it up right away, no questions asked. Here it is on the quad, I think it looks really awesome. We'll see if there's any ground clearance issues. When I went to put the front plastic on the quad, I remembered the key was bent, so I went ahead and put a normal e-bike key in. All I had to do was grind a little bit. I also realized that the plastic was cracked here, so I cut some aluminum pieces out to brace it up. After that, I did another test ride. Next, it's time to install the display. This is a DKD display that came with the motor kit. It fits really nicely right here. My first design was this one piece of aluminum that would clamp on the top two bolts and hold the screen in place, but it didn't want to clamp right, it just kept slipping out. So, for each side, I'm going to make a piece of aluminum that clamps under both bolts so it won't slip out, and then the screen can bolt to it on each side with these bolts here. I added some double sided tape to make sure the screen doesn't rattle at all. I was going to remove the gas tank, but it turns out I need it to mount the seat correctly, so I cut the bottom out and now I'm going to put the charging ports inside the gas cap. Once I added a 3-speed switch in the gas tank, I put LED bulbs in the stock headlights and then put two extra light pods for maximum brightness. Now all I have to do is finish up the wiring. The wiring was all pretty straightforward, except for the signal wire for the display. I first tried the light blue wire, then the purple wire, and it finally worked when I did the brown wire. After doing all that, the quad was done except for the battery. I decided I'm going to go all out and get the top of the line cells so I can make the best battery possible. What I have right here is a box of 100 MolyCell P45B cells. If I made a battery with just the cells in this box, it would already be easily the most powerful battery I've ever made. So of course I'm going to be using 3 boxes, 300 cells, and making an absolute overkill battery. What you're looking at right now could output the equivalent of 65 horsepower, which is about 48,000 watts. To manage all that power, I need a really good BMS, so I'm using this one right here. It's an ant BMS that can handle 17 to 24 cells in series, 420 amps continuous, and bursts of up to 1,050 amps. To start building the battery, I first assembled all of the hexagon cell spacers. I then put the cells into the spacers and put the BMS on top to try and figure out what configuration would work best. I'm going to be using the same copper sheets I used earlier inside the battery. The main negative is going to be pretty easy, just one like that and then another one bent and bolted on. And then on the charge minus side, I have another piece bent like that so I can bolt all my cables up top. Now is when things get tricky. On the positive side, I'm going to have another copper sheet like that but I have to have the current start at the top and go to the bottom so the whole pack drains evenly. And then I'll take another copper sheet, bolt it to the bottom, and then put some insulation in between the rest so the current flows back up to the top. Then at the top I'll have another bent piece like this, insulated from the negative terminal. That way both the terminals are right next to each other, which should make the cables super easy to make. Now that I have the layout figured out, it's time to start spot welding with 0.15mm nickel and 0.15mm copper. Here's what I got so far. I have all the spot welding done except for this center section and the two ends. Over here on the negative side, I've got the 0.5mm copper sheet and then the 0.15mm copper so I can spot weld and then another 0.5 millimeter copper sheet on top of that with these little screws to clamp it all together. On the positive side, I'm going to have the 0.5 millimeter copper sheet and then the 0.15 millimeter copper to spot weld 
and then another 0.5 millimeter copper sheet, just like the other side. Now remember, I want the current to flow from the top to the bottom and back up, so I'm going to put a spacer here at the bottom, and then I'm going to put some insulation here so the two sides don't touch. After that, I'm going to put two more layers of 0.5 millimeter copper. This time, they have bigger holes around where the bolts go so the bolts don't connect. I've made sure to space everything out so I'm only putting the bolts in the gaps between the cells so I don't hurt any of the cells. When it comes to drilling through soft, thin materials like copper sheets, it helps to clamp them between two pieces of wood. Here's how the end pieces look all bolted together. I think they turned out pretty nice. Of course, I'm using thread locker on all the bolts in this battery because I can't just reach in there and tighten them up. To separate the two halves, I cut out a piece of plastic and then put the temperature sensors inside it like I've done on a few of my other packs. Now it's time to fold it up. I'm trying my best to not put a super sharp bend in the copper because then it may break later. Here it is. I put some tape around it to make sure it doesn't move at all. It looks like this first inch got bent pretty sharp, but the rest of it got bent pretty smoothly, so I don't think it's going to be a problem. The balance wires and the temperature sensor wires were super easy to do since they were all up top. I decided to put some copper spacers here to make sure the copper never rubs on the BMS and shorts out. Here's the first two bent pieces of copper. I think they turned out pretty good. Once I put these on, I connected the balance wires and then I connected the charger to make sure everything was working properly. After that, I added the rest of the bent pieces. For these bolted connections, I had to do the trick where you tape the bolt to the wrench and then start in the middle and work my way out. Here it is once I added plastic sheets to the side and fish paper everywhere else. After that, I put electrical tape on the corners and then wrapped everything up with capped on tape. Now it's time for the shrink wrap. Luckily, I already had this giant shrink wrap because I made that Ego battery. Well, that could have gone a bit better. You can see it bunched up on the corners there, but I think it'll be fine. I went ahead and finished it up with some hot glue. When I test fitted the battery in the quad, I could see that I'm going to have to remove these two little supports down here to get the battery to sit lower. Other than that, I think it's going to be easy to mount. I've got plenty of room. I went ahead and made this foam representation of the battery because I was breaking my back constantly lifting it up. To make a platform for the battery to sit, I'm going to chop up the battery tray from my old Razor scooter. Once I got that attached, I started thinking about what I'm going to do with this back section. Luckily, I had this piece from the Windown E2 e-bike, so I'm just going to slap it on right here and bolt it on the top. For the front, I'm going to stick some aluminum pieces on these stock mounts like this, and then on the bottom, I welded on some mounts that I cut off from another point on the quad. After that, I put the battery in the quad, and I got to work making some cables to connect the battery to the controller. After I mounted the battery in the quad, I realized I had the old engine mounts that I could put bolts in and really clamp the battery in place. That combined with this one single piece of duct tape and this battery is super secure. When I bolted the cables to the battery, I remembered to put two XT60 connectors here for the charging ports.
After that, I put the plastics back on the quad, and just like that, the quad is done. Now, before you comment that I should paint the battery black or wrap it in black tape or something, let me explain why I didn't. The more you wrap up the battery, the longer it takes for the battery to cool off because the heat has to travel through more insulation. Now that I've ridden it a few times, I know that's not really a problem, but I didn't want to risk it. The frame is rusty in some spots, and the paint's starting to come off the front suspension, so I'll probably just strip the whole quad down and paint the frame, and at that point, I'll put some black tape on the battery. Anyways, it's time to hit the trails. <laughs> I told my brother I was riding the quad, so he had to pull up and give it a try. At some point during this ride, the top idler completely disintegrated, so I got a new one and put it on, but that one only lasted about an hour, so I guess I don't really need those. So far, I've only had the quad up to 50% power because that was plenty for the trails, but now it's time to hit the streets and see what this thing will really do. On gravel, I couldn't get traction at any speed. I would have had some really awesome footage from this ride, but my Insta360 decided to corrupt it all. Now that I know this quad has a ton of power, I wanted to do something where I can actually use all the power, which is run paddle tires on sand. So I headed down to the river. The paddle tires worked great, but there were some other problems. Because this chain is so low, it just sucked up a bunch of sand, it got between the chain and the sprocket and just bind it up really bad, and it got to the point where this part was like totally solid, which can't be good. Another problem was, the controller got way too hot, so I'm definitely going to need a heatsink if I want to do that again. That's all for this video, thanks for watching!